Aaron Stern, welcome to the new school. Thank you. Aaron, you are the president and founder of the Academy for the Love of Learning uh, in uh, New Mexico. You are a musician, teacher, and uh, internationally recognized consultant on learning. Um, we were brought together by our mutual friend Jennifer Stoll, who is sitting here, directs the retreat site at Commonweal, and uh, has been um, uh, a very formative senior staff person here at Commonweal, bringing um, uh, a depth of uh, experiential knowing about um, uh, invisible realms uh, to our work for a long time. And um, so she went to considerable effort to... She did. This together. <laughs> so I just want to thank Jennifer for that. Persistent. Hallelujah. Yeah. And, uh, and we, um, we had a chance to talk for an hour. We'd never met before, just before we began this conversation. And I must say that um, I'd done some research on your work, but I began to feel how important this conversation is for me. Hmm. And I think hmm. one of the places I'd start, just about why it's important to me, is uh, it's very interesting to me because we both share secular and spiritual interests. Hmm. Um, but a lot of the language that you use to describe the work of the academy is deliberately secular language. Yeah. And you, you mentioned while we were talking, we were talking about one of the spiritual educational systems, and you said that uh, you felt that a limitation of it was that it didn't address the secular. Right. And um, I find that a fascinating and important decision of yours, mm. that the language of this center, which is really about the um, awakening of the human spirit, the language is deliberately secular in its, at least in some of its framing. Would you start there as an mm. observation? A couple of things I'd like to say. Um, as I mentioned uh, in our earlier conversation, my dear friend Matthew Fox, uh, and I know you're a fan of his work, um, likes to say that religion is to spirituality what education is to learning. Mm -hmm. And so I'll say it again, religion is to spirituality what education is to learning. And I'm so interested in learning, and learning will set us free. And there's nothing more um, secular <laughs> than learning. We all do it. I always think of a kid, a baby in the hand, and the child is just watching the hand. Mm. What is it? It's wonder. Mm. And there's just no way to um, capture the flag around wonder. There's no religion that can uh, own wonder. Mm -hmm. And so there's something about the secularity of learning that is so uh, f liberating and open and belongs to all of us. We don't have to do anything to have it. We just are it. So I think that was a very important uh, reason for that. And then... Um, in my experience with many different systems uh, of sp spiritual systems, let's say religions or cosmologies or what have you, um, people's relationship to the system can be very tight. And so the transmission to children, so I'm even thinking of these magnificent things like Waldorf education. If the teachers are holding it like this, religiously, Mm -hmm. The transmission is not the transmission of freedom or liberation. Mm -hmm. And liberation and freedom really are what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I was walking a very careful line, and I wanted to continue to walk that line and take a stand for freedom. Mm -hmm. Let's start just by asking you to describe the Academy for the Love of Learning. Where is it? What is it? 
It's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it's um, in a beautiful, beautiful 86-acre campus on rolling hills in the very, very beginning of the Rocky Mountains, I'm told. Mm -hmm. I haven't verified this, but everyone who comes there uh, tells me that this is actually the very beginning or the end, we could look at it either way, of the Rocky Mountains. At the Sangre de Cristo range, the Blood of Christ range, mm -hmm. and um, it's on blessed land. Mm -hmm. um, when we first got there, we cleared the land of almost 300,000 pounds of garbage mm -hmm. on our hands and knees, mm -hmm. as Jennifer knows. <laughs> and so we picked it up piece after piece after piece to clear the land. It's uh, the land of Tewa. So the Tewa uh, community, uh, in Native American community's land. And we've had profound uh, relationships with the Tewa community and blessings on that land. We've had Rinpoches come and bless the land. So we have the Tibetan Buddhists. We have the Native Americans. We have the feng shui experts. We have everybody blessing that land. Mm -hmm. And uh, through the process of many years of reclaiming that land, we've restored it into um, a spiritually vibrant, as Matt Fox likes to call it, a post-religious place. And so, um, and at the center of that is learning. And what we have are a series of programs, all different kinds of programs, many of them arts-infused, arts-based, because I'm an artist, a musician, um, by, <laughs> by core. <laughs> That's <laughs> sort of what I was and what I still am and will always be. Mm. So all of our work is infused with music and art. And fundamentally, it's about learning as a way to wake up. So we take the lid off learning. Mm. It's a big language that we use and develop there. And in our work, no matter what the program is, whether it's teacher renewal, I'm working with hundreds of public school teachers uh, and the whole system of public education in Santa Fe, in northern New Mexico, our Life Songs, which is an intergenerational program for folks at the end of life, who get to tell their stories to children mm. and then render those stories into song and then a big annual performance at the big performing center in Santa Fe where people who at end of life get their stories told and heard. It's like a redemption story for each person mm. um, celebrating a life or whether it's El Otro Lado in the schools, which began as a program for undocumented folks in the community as a way to get their stories told. And now it's a program in the public schools. And on and on, we have many programs. Leading by Being, which is our foundation program, our evenings of exploration, all of them have at the very core this notion of taking the lid off learning and making contact with other human beings in the process of learning and learning how to become better at being human beings, mm -hmm. all of it. In your foundational uh, uh, course, you mentioned that um, one of the frames that you use is the work of Alexander Lowen on character structure. And I wondered if you would walk us through why, of all the many things you could have chosen as foundational, you uh, are using Alexander Lowen's work on mm. character structure. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Um, liberation from um, patterns that separate us from each other mm. is, I think, at the center of, of my answer. Mm. So um, if I can stay in contact really as deeply as possible with the core of my being while I'm in the presence of you, I can make contact with you mm. at the core of your being or anywhere you might be situated. Mm. And there are patterns of engagement that we learn very early in childhood uh, in our family contexts, in our social contexts, that actually separate us from each other pretty, pretty uh, significantly. So I think um, the work of Lowen for me, why it's important is it actually gives us access to reconnecting inwardly and therefore connecting outwardly with another. 
So Lowen's work, uh, which comes out of the work of Reich, so he was the... Uh, Wilhelm Reich. Wilhelm Reich. Yeah. So Lowen uh, somatized it. He brought it into a very deep body context, which really interested me a lot. So we were talking about my, my right foot. Um, if my right foot begins to move this way, I have grown the capacity for fleeing out of fear mm -hmm. and leaving contact with my experience. And I really am just gone. And in those moments, often which are triggered by something else completely that could be a memory, I could look around a room and I could see faces and not know these faces and become frightened for some reason. And I'm already gone. I've left contact with my own being and therefore everybody else that's sitting here. And it really often could be just a transference or a counter-transference to use psychological language. It could be something that really is from the past and not from the present. And so the practice that can, uh, one can uh, uh, begin to uh, develop through the work of Lowen is coming back. It's the practice of coming back so that I don't leave. And I can actually negotiate um, what it means to stay. I can say, you know, Michael, I have to move my chair back a little bit, or I need a little bit of water, or I need to make contact with the folks in this room. I see friendly faces. And through that, I can come back. And by coming back and being here, I can be here with you mm. and others. And that's the deeper longing, actually, is to be here as a full embodied human being. Mm. And you mentioned that there are sort of three levels of it. There's the level of uh, the somatically based character structures that we developed in response to life. Below that, there's the free self. Correct. And below that, there's no self, yeah. right? right? And so the intention is to move down yeah. sort of archaeologically <laughs> right. to these inner... Inner yes. Understanding that we will always be triggered, right. we will always become afraid mm -hmm. for some reason or another. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the banishment of fear, it's actually the ability to be, to have the freedom to come and go, mm -hmm. I would say. So that when there's space, so there could be a moment of a freeze, but then there's a breath and there's a remembrance mm -hmm. and there's an understanding of the somatic pattern. And by just relaxing the pattern, we become more deeply connected to what I would call our deeper voice. Mm -hmm. And we have the agency to be able to act on behalf of something else. Mm -hmm. So in the foundational work and throughout your work, uh, you have, uh, you were speaking of, you have a, a program called Leading by Being. Correct. Um, and um, you talk about... Um, discovering the contours of consciousness and the construction of the adoptive self, which is the, the character structure self. Um, uh, and you said beautifully to me that, um, uh, uh, that the goal of the freedom you seek is about space, and it's about not being identified with the structures. Yeah. Um, and then... Um, Jennifer Stowell, our friend, spoke of an early program that she was in with you, mm -hmm. um, it, which was about, the focus was, what is yours to do? Mm -hmm. Which I love. I mean, that's, you know, sort of a foundational question. And Jennifer spoke of a woman who was in the program who was having panic attacks. Right. And that you did an extended piece of work with her, which Jennifer said was perhaps the most beautiful piece of work she's ever seen done with anyone, mm -hmm. in which uh, you helped her uh, to come back into her body and to reestablish herself with the kind of ease you're describing. Mm -hmm. Can you, do you remember that well enough to speak of it? I, I do remember it. Yeah. I remember how we ended up staying later, <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. which is always a boundary issue, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it, it's, um, yes, I do. I do remember it. Mm. And I remember other kinds of work, similar kinds of work. I'm, that may be too private a question given boundaries. That's just exactly what exactly. I was sorting. All right. Yeah. All right. 
But I, but I can say that that freedom, you know, we're always going to come across that moment right. of leaving. Mm-hmm. Of course, in, in a way, it's death practice, mm-hmm. in a way. Mm-hmm. It's how do we stay quite present to our experience mm-hmm. and not leave, mm-hmm. even in the most harrowing moments. Mm-hmm. And so when, when, when a person is having a panic attack and leaving, as mm-hmm. it were, um, then it becomes, well, what's the route back? Mm-hmm. And can you play with the polarity of gone here, mm-hmm. gone here? Mm-hmm. And then in that very moment, you're in a fluid, living relationship to the story. Mm-hmm. You're no longer overly identified with leaving or staying, mm-hmm. frankly. Mm-hmm. So you're alive. Rudolf Steiner always said, it's aliveness. Mm-hmm. I'm always interested in some of the things that he said. Ultimately, it's aliveness. So that process that I'm describing to you is a process we teach classroom teachers. So when they're in these moments of, you know, they're, they, every moment of the day is scripted for them. Mm-hmm. By minute six, I mean, this is total insanity. What has this to do with learning? Mm-hmm. I'm really sorry, I'm going off on a tangent mm-hmm. here, but, but they, they're so scripted every minute of the day for these kids now. By minute four, you will have done the diagramming sentences, and by minute five, you're going to be in spelling, and, you know, it's like that. Well, if they lose themselves for even a moment, they're really in trouble. Mm. So this ability to uh, bring themselves back to center, back to presence, Mm. et cetera, is really, really, really important. So that is one of the things that we teach teachers all the time. Mm -hmm. So they have that skill, that capacity. Mm -hmm. You spoke of music being central to your work and, and spoke of your own grounding in music as the thing that that you know best. Um, And um, Leonard Bernstein was um, a mentor, a partner, um, central to your uh, evolution. Um, Can you say more about um, how to frame this question? Um, Can you say more about his role and inspiration in the creation of the Academy Mm. for the Love of Learning? Mm. Yeah. Well, I'd say first and foremost, he believed in me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I cannot emphasize how important that was. Mm -hmm. And I used to go with my little dot matrix printouts, you know, I was Mm -hmm. sharing a little bit of that. And I'm sure we all remember those little things um, when the printer worked Mm -hmm. (laughs) and the paper would come out. That's And so I would show up and I have, um, I can't tell you how many... Uh, pieces of paper I have from the early 1980s on uh, until we con- we conceived the academy together, Lenny and I did, and announced it at this big event at his house at the Dakota. And there were about 100 people there. We talked about Howard Gardner present mm-hmm. and many, many just amazing folks who were there. Lauren Bacall, of course, you know, all, all the usual suspects who lived at the Dakota, but also many, many people. And, um, you know, The fact that he believed in me and I would come and I would bring these papers to him and I'd say, you see, if this happens, if we take the lid off learning and I was developing a language for all of my work, then this would happen. And, you know, he would, in some ways, he really challenged me because he was very, um, as I was mentioning to you earlier, kind of a Faustian character imprisoned by knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so he had a huge investment in my being right. <laughs> you and you know. said that he helped free you and you helped free him. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, From that's your true. From different imprisonments. That we were both imprisoned and I was imprisoned. You know, I, I was mentioning to you earlier in the, the deep spirit of Judaism, really. The spirit, not, mm-hmm. not the religion of Judaism, but the spirit of Judaism mm-hmm. that I feel is so... Um, central to my experience, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, in his, in, so mine was the, the Bina, as it's called, version of that, and his was the, was the Hakma. And so... For those who don't know... Yes, you just you're all being that, tested on this Bina. later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so these are, are part of the Kabbalah. Right. And these are part of the Tree of Life. Right. 
and um, which it, starts with the chokhmah, right? Well, it starts well, no. with the kiter. Starts with the kiter, yeah. then to chokhmah, and then to bina. Yeah, bina. It, it turns out it's bina's on the left and chokhmah's on the right. Right, right. Unless you're inside the tree looking out. I was right. reading about this last night. Right. Uh-huh. It, but but the point is, one is knowledge um, through the acquisition of knowledge mm. through the reading of, and the mm. moving of knowledge mm. around and analyzing it, etc. Bina, on the other hand, is more of the feminine knowing, mm. which is the receptive knowing. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lenny used to say, I've never been able to verify this, but um, there are two verbs, and I believe one is Latin and one is Greek. I can't trace this back, and uh, Cliff, you may know this. (laughs) But one is um, skire, which I know is accurate, which comes out of which comes science, Mm -hmm. scissors, breaking things apart. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of knowledge that Lenny was really good at. But then the other one, it comes, I believe it's, it comes out of the, the verb saper, mm-hmm. sapore. Mm-hmm. And that means um, like sap in a tree, the life-giving fluid that informs the limbs. Mm-hmm. That would be me. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> we were skiere and sapore. I even wrote a rap song. There are at least two ways to know skiere. <laughs> anyway, I'll spare you that. <laughs> I wrote that for The Wrinkle in Time, those of you who know that Whoa. charming, wonderful Sorry. book. <laughs> I wrote a whole show about that, but anyway. Um, but... It's just fascinating to me. And so little Charles Wallace in that book would hear, would right before the phone would ring, he'd say, the phone's going to ring. Mm-hmm. And Meg, who didn't know how to do that, his sister would, how did you know that was going to ring? Mm-hmm. And so it's like that, how do you know? Well, you know. And so those two uh, kinds of knowing were what Lenny and I both were situated in and stood for. And I have to tell you, in the last decade of Lenny's life, Mm -hmm. his question was, and he put it exactly like this, was, don't we never learn? Mm -hmm. Right? And it's actually a very profound question. And we look around the world we're living in now, and it's a really important question. Mm -hmm. Are we going back? Are we going to have another Holocaust, perhaps? Mm -hmm. You know, don't we never learn? Why did he say it that way? Well, he liked to play with words. I got it. But, you know, at that time, I was exploring transformative experience. Mm -hmm. And I was already moving into my life's work. Mm -hmm. And I used, you know, John Bennett. I know you're interested in Gurdjieff's work. Mm -hmm. So there's a beautiful quote that comes from his book, Witness. Mm -hmm. And in that quote, he specifically says, we can be free from the past, but it's only when we... Gosh, I wish I could get this quote to you exactly. It's on the card. Oh, I have a prop. <laughs> we hand this out to everybody, and I, you know, it's one of those quotes that I can't get right without it. We can be free from the past only when we have so changed ourselves as to be no longer the same person who performed the action. Oh. Right? Yeah, that's a beautiful quote. A dis- let me just read the end of it. A dishonest man um, does not become honest simply by ceasing to act dishonestly, but by an inward change that makes it impossible for him to act dishonestly. I know that human beings can do that. I know I have uh, experienced that kind of transformation as a human being. And so I extrapolate from that that we can experience that kind of transformation as human beings collectively. So can you say more about how, what experience led you to know that for yourself? Hmm. Wow. Or set of experiences. What was the journey Hmm. into that transformation? Hmm. Well, it's a a really intimate question. Yes. You didn't tell me you were going to ask questions like this. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I go to taking the lid off learning. So one of the issues, one of the big journeys for me has been around my sexuality. Mm-hmm. And so finding out the authentic sexual expression, what is truly me, mm-hmm. um, and actually not accepting convention mm-hmm. and opening to the depth of exploration that that's been for me mm-hmm. from 
heterosexuality to homosexuality to I don't even know, mm -hmm. frankly, what that um, journey has. Uh, I don't know where the end of the journey is. I'm still on it. Mm -hmm. And so transforming my view of what so-called that has been planted in me. So it's a transformation of view is one thing I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one answer, and I know that's happened for me. Mm -hmm. I've transformed into a more honest being mm -hmm. in the course of a lifetime, lying to myself and therefore lying to others, just through basic ignorance, I would say, dishonesty through ignorance. Um, so that's another example I can give to you. But I think on a more um, constructed self level, so by which I mean in the Lowen's work, I can see that I no longer flee out of anxious fear or something. I can stay. Mm -hmm. And that's huge. I can stay present to myself in a way that I wasn't able to once before. And it's not even about the age and wisdom that comes through age, because there's that. You know, at my age, at 69, I, I always sort. You know, is this just the natural course of life? You know, I've just become riper, <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. So I think there's that, but there's also, um, this was 30 years ago when I learned this little trick with my right foot. I learned how to stay. Hmm. I learned how to regulate emotion. Now that's, that is a really important thing, uh, which is something we can learn to do and we can be trained to do. But choosing that and choosing, choosing is another point of transformation for me. That's a, that's a choice point. It's not just about regulation and knowing the mechanics of it. It's actually using awareness to recognize a moment and making a choice. And I, I want to add another thing to that. As a man, as a white man, walking around this world with profound privilege mm. in the face in New Mexico, where there are folks who have, they're undocumented, they don't even have the right to be, mm. and also the Native American communities with whom I've developed these beautiful relationships. I've had to learn about white privilege. I've had to learn about the endowment of privilege that I just sit inside of. That's a lifelong unraveling. So those are transformational moments. Mm. I am not a person who walks around ignorant to that anymore. Mm. I am awake to it. And there's so much more about it that I'm not awake to, that it's, it's a journey that continues. But I feel I'm safer in the world for other people mm. as a result of that. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. Squirrel Hill to be precise. Mm -hmm. And lived there until I was eight, and then I moved to North Miami Beach, Florida. And what kind of family did you grow up in? Hmm. Hmm. Did you ever read Bernstein or hear Bernstein's opera Trouble in Tahiti? <laughs> <laughs> Barbara knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> it was that kind of family. It was an upwardly mobile, aspiring, miserable. Violent father, um, silent mom, terrified mom, um, Jewish, but mildly Jewish, um, wonderful grandparents, Sadie, <laughs> Sadie and Sam. My grandfather was the Kohen of the temple, so the high priest, as it were. Who were you like in eighth grade? <laughs> Eighth grade, I was in military school. They didn't know what to do with me. They sent me to military school for a year, which, which actually was probably the best experience ever because there was no regulation in my family. Was this, you were, were, you, were you now in Florida? Or? Florida, so, Miami Military Academy. All right. They had sailboats, that mm -hmm. was fun. Mm -hmm. Horses, you know, it was mm -hmm. mildly military school. But it was regimented, and there was no regimentation in my family. Mm -hmm. um, there was no consistent discipline. And so that consistency was really important to me. It taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. The only real consistent discipline I had came out of myself 
as a music student because I would sit there playing. I had a piano in my bedroom, mm. and I would just practice, practice, practice. Practicing and, what? Oh. Then, mm -hmm. Mozart, Bach, mm -hmm. Beethoven, early Beethoven sonatas, Chopin, Haydn sonatas. On the piano. On the piano. Mm. Mm. And did you go to high school in Florida? I did. Uh-huh. Uh, and what were you like as a senior in high school? Oh. I couldn't wait to get out of there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were a lot of... Was it a public school? Public school. Mm -hmm. It was a mixed experience. Um, I was passionately interested in knowledge, mm -hmm. and I, was compl I felt completely missed. I, I felt like no, nobody saw me. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel seen. And then there was always the problem at the end of the year was beat up the Jews Day mm -hmm. in Miami. Mm -hmm. So it was a big, you know, problem because what do I do? Do I sneak out the back way or, you know? So there, it was a, a pretty uh, challenging experience. And I had a brother. And so it comes back to the family who passed away at that time mm -hmm. of leukemia. So mm -hmm. it was another part of the family story. Mm -hmm. So I was drawn very deeply into uh, adulthood in a way, meeting the challenges of a pretty um, dysfunctional family and then the loss of a sibling uh, and parents who really couldn't recover from that. So it was a lot of family stuff pulling me in. But honestly, as a student, music was great. I loved choir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I accompanied, the, I was the assistant accompanist for the choir, so I liked that. Mm -hmm. And But the rest of it was challenging. Mm -hmm. It was really scary frankly, alienating. And what was your sense of yourself at that point? Who did you experience mm. yourself as being? Mm. Essentially good. Mm -hmm. I had a really clear sense of being essentially good. Had you discovered any parts of your sexuality at that point? Um, I was really confused. You were confused. Very confused. Yeah, yeah. So I was living a conventional sexuality, but also aware that there was something else knocking mm -hmm. on the door. Mm -hmm. I went so far as to getting married when I was 23, having children. I have five grand, five grandchildren. I've had a thing for a minute. Wow. So I've, I've led a very uh, complex life, mm -hmm. or um, rich life, complex mm -hmm. in the best sense of that. Um, so... Yeah, I, I, I felt like that was a, a big question for me. I was interested, but it was so impossible. Right. <laughs> there were no images right. of anything other than convention. Mm. And this, is, again, is Miami, which is it's the South, right. big time. It's like, you know, Alabama, but only it's Miami. Did you go to college right after high school? I did. Where did you go? University of Miami. Uh huh. And what was that like? Uh, well, it was really interesting because I studied music, and they have a good music school there. Mm -hmm. Actually, I began even as a uh, high school kid studying with Phil Spitalny, and uh, mm -hmm. we all know Phil Spitalny and his all girls band. Mm -hmm. and he was a conductor, so I would study conducting, mm -hmm. and uh, so I was experimenting and studying, of course, piano always. But there was something in me that was restless about that. It didn't feel like a complete life to me only uh, to dwell in music. Mm -hmm. And so there was this restlessness, mm -hmm. and, um, uh, which I talked a lot with Bernstein about later in life, you know, that restlessness. Um, but college for me was, uh, it was very big, uh, and it was very, I, I felt, again, really alone. Mm. I felt alone in my suffering, alone in my confusions. I had nowhere to go or anyone to talk to. Mm. One of the most vivid memories I have, positive experiences in my childhood, was um, Dr. Jaffe. He was the family doctor. His wife, whose name is escaping me right now, Mrs. Jaffe, we'll call her, mm -hmm. who said, do you like opera? And I said, I don't know. But, I mean, I would hear music and burst into tears. I, I just was so moved by it. And she sat down with me, Lucille was her name, mm. and she said, I'm going to take you through an opera. And so we sat down together and um, listened to La Boheme. Mm. And then Madame Butterfly. And it was like one after. And she took me through the libretto. I still even remember the 
33 and a third records that were inside those little thick boxes. Mm -hmm. And I just, I will never forget that somebody, I'm going to cry, mm -hmm. somebody cared enough to actually meet me mm -hmm. and find out who I was and what I loved. Mm -hmm. it, it contrasted with a, a father who just didn't know what to make of me. I didn't like baseball. Mm -hmm. you know, I had all the, all the things that he you know, didn't know what to do about. And I would hear music and I would cry. And he would just say, are you going to cry again? Mm. He would just do that. Like a girl. Mm. It was lovely. <laughs> mm. Mm. So, I mean, I laugh now um, because I've worked through a lot of it. And I forgive him. You know, I, I could see his own. He was a product of his own uh, upbringing at mm -hmm. times. What so, did you do after college? Where did you go from there? Well, I took a little pause um, and um, moved to Chicago pretty early on. I met a woman, a young girl, I mean, mm. young woman. A she was actually older than I, frankly, come to think of it, seven years older than mm. I. At the air I was going to go to graduate school, mm -hmm. and I was going to go in education. Mm -hmm. I had decided that was what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I was flying through Chicago, and I met her at the airport, and she was, I remember still, she was just sitting on the ground the floor, I had flown to the wrong airport, long story, but I wanted to fly on a 747, and they had just, you know, started those. So I, th I flew from Pittsburgh, where my parents by then had returned mm -hmm. uh, to Pittsburgh from Florida, and uh, I was visiting them. I got in an airplane to go to Denver, where I was going to go explore graduate schools in Boulder, and on the way, changed flights in Chicago so I could change onto a 747. Mm -hmm. And they didn't fly them out of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So um, inadvertently, I had flown into the wrong airport in Chicago. I went to this little, tiny little airport called Midway. Well, I know it well. You know it well. <laughs> no 747s right. at Midway. Right. Right. But I met my wife. And so instead of an airplane, I met this amazing woman, Antoinette. It's really beautiful artist spirit. Mm. And um, so um, I went to Colorado, and she was on her way to Colorado. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was in the early 70s, and we still, had, you know, it was sort of mm -hmm. safe enough still mm -hmm. for people to meet each other at airports and go on journeys together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did, and that lasted for nine years, mm -hmm. that journey. So that brought me to Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then I went to school at the University of Chicago and studied composition with a fellow named Easley Blackwood, mm -hmm. a microtonal dude, mm -hmm. and Shulamit Ron, who is this amazing Israeli composer you may know of. Mm -hmm. So, um, Pulitzer Prize winning composer. And um, so, and then I became the dean of a college of music in Chicago. So I did nine years, I, I'd like to say, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. It's very cold. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's where I, um, and then I met a man, and I th and that woke me up. And the and I came back to my wife, and I said, I don't know what to do, but this is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I had to follow. How did she respond? She was heartbroken. Mm -hmm. She never recovered from that. Mm -hmm. She actually never. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I I felt. In, there was a lot of integrity in that. Mm -hmm. I've thought a lot about it over the years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, life is really funny. We could make choices mm -hmm. or not, and mm -hmm. we could. It, it was actually a choice. Mm -hmm. And I wonder sometimes what would it have been like had I chosen not to leave that relationship. Mm -hmm. And it would have been a different life, and it would have been a wonderful life, mm -hmm. just a different life. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the. How to, how to assess the gains mm -hmm. and losses. But this feels like a more authentic life than that would have been. But you talked about earlier about, um, about the evolution of your sexual understanding of yourself, your sexuality, mm -hmm. and how being honest with yourself about that, going back to that quote mm -hmm. from Bennett, yeah. uh, was fundamental to becoming someone different from the person who <laughs> did the, the previous act. And right. you know, I, I'm I've always been fascinated by eros and sexuality, and and eros has been central to my own life mm. in a very fundamental way. Mm. Uh, 
And A.H. Almas, we were talking about him, who does the diamond approach, he actually has a book uh, on, on eros and sexuality. It's a beautiful little book, which he did with his, one of his partners. Yes, who, yes. Who co-teaches with him. And he makes a very important distinction. I mean, we all know that you can have sexuality without eros, but people don't think about the possibility you can also have eros without sexuality. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and the power of sexuality is enormous, but the power of eros is a... More powerful. Different powerful. Yeah, yeah. it's a multiplier yeah. beyond belief. And of yeah. course, in the Sufi tradition, among others, uh, you know, the Sufis call themselves the slaves of love, you know, <laughs> among other right. things. And I think often about the different strategies that different religious and spiritual traditions have <laughs> for dealing with both eros and sexuality, mm -hmm. and how uh, some of them teach that the love of the divine is only reached if you cut off the sexual. Uh, and others um, understand that, um, take Socrates, for example, that, that, that following the yearning uh, leads to more and more inclusive and deeper forms of love over time. Mm -hmm. That not rejecting it, but rather following the yearning. Right. Uh, but yet in, in Plato and in Socrates, you have mm -hmm. the teaching that the wisdom function must control the emotions, right. ultimately, right. for to be a realized man. I've been reading uh, Michel Foucault's History of Sexuality. I don't know if you know it. It's I know Foucault, but book, I don't know. An extraordinary book. And it, it is about, um, it's so interesting to read it in this period of time <laughs> because, you know, uh, the, the, the Greeks uh, problematized sex between uh, men and young boys, or younger boys. And that was their issue, and they approved of it, mm. but under very careful structures of mm -hmm. behavior on both the part, part of the boy and the man. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, mm. and in all of this, it was requisite mm. that on the man's part, but also on the boy's part, that the wisdom function was actually in control of the relationship. And it seems to me, I mean, it's an obvious point, but that our understanding in this culture of both sexuality and eros in general is so primitive. Yeah. It's so primitive. And given how, speaking of learning, yeah. that the profound relationship between being able to be honest with ourselves both about our sexuality and even more important about our arrows hmm. is pretty fundamental to living an examined life. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> what are your reflections on that? Hmm. Well, I was just thinking of the quote, the unexamined life is not worth living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I flashed on that quote at the end of mm -hmm. what you said. Um, hmm. I, I go to Bernstein. You what? I go to Bernstein yeah. right now. Say more. Um, hmm. You know, he chased me around the dining room table all the time. <laughs> I was really cute. <laughs> and I wasn't interested. Uh-huh. And so we had to navigate this erosexuality um, dance mm -hmm. because I loved him so profoundly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, he would walk in the room. We, would see, we spent so much time together, mm -hmm. and everybody was envious of that. All of the, mm -hmm. the people around mm -hmm. him, you know, they just they hated me mm -hmm. because he loved me so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there was this whole weirdness mm -hmm. that I had to navigate, and I was pretty young, mm -hmm. you know. I was 33, 34, 35, and I, and I, I just thought, what, what? And he was how old at that point? So he was always 30 years older than I, so 63, 62, mm -hmm. yeah, 60, yeah. you know. Yeah. He was, I met him around his 60th birthday, my 30th. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
So it was this really weird dance to have to be able to do because mm. I would see him and we would be looking at each other right now and we would stare at each other forever. Mm-hmm. And so he said things like, when I look into your eyes, I see my own soul. Mm-hmm. And I would be having the corresponding experience. Mm-hmm. And that has just nothing to do with sexuality. Mm-hmm. But then there would all, and it was utter love. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had to love him warts and all, and he had to love me warts and all, mm-hmm. because it was a force of nature. It was mm-hmm. not arbitrary. Mm-hmm. It, was not con- it, it wasn't even about controlling. Mm-hmm. It was just a fact. Right. It was like that. Mm-hmm. And that's, to me, that, that, that kind of love and destiny mm-hmm. love. Um, and then there was chasing me around the dining room table. Mm-hmm. And my having to learn how... On some level, um, it didn't really even matter after a while. Mm-hmm. It just didn't. I would just laugh. Lenny, sit down. Mm-hmm. It was almost like um, a, um, it was not a portal for me, mm-hmm. but it was not an obstacle either. Mm-hmm. Um, because the other love was so much bigger. It was so much more pervasive, all-encompassing, mm-hmm. and undeniable. Mm-hmm. And so... I, I think um, I learned so much about love through him. Mm. He taught me how to love Mm. in that. Had it mm. Mm -hmm. not been for him, I wouldn't have experienced that kind of love. Mm -hmm. And I miss him all the time. Mm. May I ask, did you ever become lovers? No. Mm. Mm -hmm. No. No, it was not... um, do you know that beautiful quote? It is the obstructed brook that sings. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. <laughs> I do. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. I think the great loves are often obstructed. Yeah. It's. I think it's. You know, Jung talked about this. Yeah, it's interesting. It's. It's often um, because when when a love is realized. Actually, do you know James Hillman's work? I do. Yeah. yeah. James Hillman talks about all of us as boarding houses. Right. And that right. each of us contains a whole multiple set of selves. Right. He says there's some that come out during the day and play by the rules. Right. There's some that come out at night and play by different rules. Right. And there are others that never come out of the rooms at all. Right. And so when two people get together and, mm. and you know, consummate a love, yes. they've presented a few of their denizens of their boarding houses at the beginning. Right. But over time, they get to know the whole... The whole Megilla. Set. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so what happens to that intense, in the best of cases, erotic as well as sexual love, but certainly erotic love, yeah. is that it gets stretched and stretched yeah. to be able to encompass. And very often it reaches a point at which it really cannot encompass. Mm-hmm. And because mm-hmm. the archetype that we each represented for the other right. gets lost in the, all the subpersonalities and so forth. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the case of the obstructed brook, mm-hmm. um, one mm-hmm. works with a relationship that really is a reflection of the divine mm-hmm. through the archetypes. Yeah. And, and of course, what the mistake people make is a category mistake, that mm-hmm. when they see the divine through their beloved, mm-hmm. they think that the beloved actually is the divine. Yeah, well, right. In a certain way, the beloved is the right. divine. But if they can have the consciousness yeah. to recognize that the beloved, this archetype with whom one is in love, yeah. allows one to see the divine, yeah. Without making the category mistake yes. of assuming that right. this incarnation is. Yeah. And that to me is the equivalent of taking the lid off learning. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So it's an authentic experience of exactly. love that is exactly. uncategorizable. Exactly. If that's a word. But yeah. Yeah. I ha- I feel to just tell you, um, the first time I met Bernstein was literally on my honeymoon in 1971 mm-hmm. at the world premiere of his mass at the Kennedy Center. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, by hook or by crook, I won't even tell you the story of how mm-hmm. my wife and I got tickets, but we drove up in our little 1970 orange Volkswagen Beetle, mm-hmm. parked near the Kennedy Center and came walking in in our wedding clothes because that's mm-hmm. where we went. On. We went from Pittsburgh to Washington for our honeymoon. 
And Bernstein, at the, when the concert was, when the performance was over, um, my wife said, you have to go meet him. And I said, I'm not really interested in meeting him. And she kept saying, you have to go meet him. He's been so important to you. Mm-hmm. And then she said, he has to meet you. Oh. I'll never forget that. And I just thought, oh, yeah, I think that's probably true. Mm-hmm. So we wended our way back there and we found our way to him. And I'll never forget, he saw us coming. And, you know, I didn't know about his sexuality. I didn't know anything about him. I knew about his young people's concerts, and I knew about his first symphony in particular, which I, his Jeremiah symphony, which to me is just, I just listened to it a thousand times when I was a kid for some weird reason. I I used to feel like I understood his musical decisions so well that I would have made the same ones. Or I could see how he did that, and I wouldn't have done it that way. But I just knew it Mm -hmm. so well. I knew his soul. And so I knew him through his music. And in a way, I just thought, that's enough. I don't really need to meet him. Mm-hmm. But I went and met him. And he saw us coming. And he looked, at, he looked across at us. And I'll never forget, he had a cigarette in his hand and a scotch, which could have been any time with Bernstein, because that's always what he had in his hands, <laughs> as Barbara knows. But um, he looked at me. And as we approached him, he said, do I know you? Mm-hmm. And I said, no. I was 20." Not quite 23. Mm. I became 23 in November. It was in September, September 5th or 6th, something like that, in 1971. And he said, um, are you sure? And he had, in his classic uh, kind of posture, he had his hands over my shoulders. Mm. And he's looking at me like this, and I, I was a little uncom- unnerving. And he said, well, I don't know who you are, but I know that I love you. Mm. That's what, those were his first words ever to me. <laughs> And he just, you Did know. Did he remember you when you met him? No. It, it's a good question. <laughs> he had no recollection. It was the scotch. <laughs> However, I'll tell you, <laughs> after that little engagement with me in him, mm-hmm. and my wife is sort of sitting there like looking at the future, <laughs> the handwriting was on the wall. Mm-hmm. But, but afterwards, he said, come with me. And he took me in one arm and my wife in his other arm. And he, there we wended our way through the bowels of the Kennedy Center, came up through this doorway, you know, I can't tell you exactly where we were, into this room. And it was the, the gala opening celebration of the Kennedy Center. Oh <laughs> and he said to his then manager, Skylar Chapin by name, who then became the, uh, he was a, married to a Steinway. He was the head of Steinway. And then he became the New York City cultural Mm-hmm. Michigan, you know, the big maven for New York City. Um, and um, Skyler, he said, these are my new friends. You have to put them at a, t- a really good table. And Skyler said, Lenny, you can't do that. This is an invited, you know, it's the Kennedys. You know, we can't just put them somewhere. He said, do it. <laughs> and so he walked away. And Skyler, Skyler sat me next to Barbara Walters and my wife next to Gregory Peck. I'm telling you, this is exactly what happened. And that's how we spent our honeymoon, honeymoon evening. So... And then Lenny waved, and we waved, and that was the end of Lenny for me until seven and a half years later when I re-met him. Mm-hmm. At this party in Upper New York. In, in, on 99th and West End Avenue, Philip Ramey, a composer, a friend of mine. And basically, I was the dean of the Conservatory of Music in Chicago by then, mm-hmm. experimenting with all kinds of ideas, including that, the, the flip side of this mm-hmm. little piece of paper, mm-hmm. this learning practice. Yeah. I'd already begun working with that with music students. Mm-hmm. And I was going to New York, and I had an appointment at the Ford Foundation to talk about my work and to look for support. And when I was leaving, a man called at leaving Chicago, the head of our doctoral program, um, a theorist and con- a, conduct- a composer of sorts uh, named Enrique Arias, who's no longer on the planet, a Panamanian fellow um, who introduced me to all kinds of Panamanian, like Rocky Cuadero, these mm-hmm. Panamanian composers, really interesting musicians. But he said, when you're in New York, look up this fellow, Philip Ramey. He's the program annotator for the New York Philharmonic, and he knows everybody in music, mm-hmm. and he'll get you to the right people to meet. So I had dinner in Greenwich Village with Philip Ramey, and he said, you know, as I listen to you speak, and again, I had all my dot matrix printouts, and I'm showing my diagrams, how, how, how everything works. 
And he said, you know, there's one person I think I should introduce you to because your words could be coming out of his mouth. Mm. And that's Leonard Bernstein. Mm. And I said, oi. <laughs> Again, Leonard Bernstein. It's like yesterday's onions. It kept coming back. <laughs> so, uh, so I agreed to meet him. And then on sometime a few months later in April, I came back to New York and went to this event at... Again, he was bringing uh, Bernstein and Aaron Copeland had had a bit of a falling out because Copeland wrote a piece called Connotations for the opening of Lincoln Center. You played that piece. It's a complex piece. I love that piece. 12 tone piece. piece. And so Bernstein said, Copeland's losing his voice. He can't find anything to say anymore. So now he's turning into a 12 tone Nick, meaning a Schoenberg, you know, it's a certain form of a certain kind of compositional technique. And and uh, Bernstein gave us some kind of a comment to the press about that, and Copeland was heartbroken. He was angry mm. because, you know, he was Lenny's mentor, one of his mentors. And uh, in a way, Lenny really diminished him by this comment. Mm. And he said, the heartbreaking thing for me, says Bernstein, was none of the young composers were there to see Aaron in the rehearsals, Aaron Copeland. And that was heartbreaking because he was basically saying he was no longer a valid voice. And Copeland was really hurt about that. Mm. So this was the chance for them to make up. Mm. And so that evening on 99th and West End Avenue at Philip Ramey's little penthouse apartment, penthouse, it was a one-room, tiny little studio, but its claim to fame was it had a deck. Yeah. It had a terrace. So we met there. You want to hear this story? Yes. <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. No. <laughs> but that evening, I show up at, the, at this little apartment building, and I'll never forget, as long as I live, Aaron Copeland is standing there in front of this apartment with his wonderful little blue jacket on and his tie, as humble as apple pie. I mean, he was just so... Amazing, and he was like this big nose, you know, and he, as if he stepped off Mount Rushmore, this mm. moral, he was just living moral deliciousness. Mm. And we ride on the elevator upstairs, and I was just awestruck. I just thought, oh my God. I mean, and he was as old as the century. He was born in 1900, so he would have been 80 then. Mm. So, I go in there and I just thought, I, I, I felt like I don't have to do another thing. I've met Aaron Copeland. I've had this chance. I'm going to have dinner with him. Later, coming in about 45 minutes late, comes Leonard Bernstein with his cigarette thing and his Kusevitsky cape on, all, you know. And I thought, who the hell are you? <laughs> go sit down. I'm talking to Aaron Copeland. You know, it was like it, there was almost an antipathy the minute he walked in the mm. door. Mm. Then he came to me and we started to talk. No memory of having met in 1971. We're now in 1980. Mm -hmm. 1979, I guess this was. And um, we start to talk. And honest to God, everybody else disappeared. Mm -hmm. So John Corleano, composer, was there that evening. Philip Ramey, who was a good friend of John's. Uh, Bernstein, Copeland, myself, and a fellow named David Gordon, who works at the Academy, helped me design the whole Academy. And um, one of the, Jack Gottlieb, who was Lenny's musical assistant. So it was all guys on this deck. And they disappeared, and it was me and Bernstein the whole time. It went on for hours. We just And when you say disappeared, you mean they disappeared from your consciousness? Totally. Not that they disappeared from the apartment. They Correct. Were still there. They were all there, but we didn't know yeah, anything right, about right, them. We right. were just yeah, like right. fighting. Right. Yeah. Have you read this? No. Yeah. But look at this. No. You know, it was like <laughs> uh -huh. we were passionately engaged. Mm. And in fact, it's like... Um, I wouldn't call it the same thing, but it's like when Maria and Tony meet in West Side Story, yes, yes. and all the lights go down, and it's right. just the two of them. Right, exactly. Except that we were fighting. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what happened that night. And at the end of that evening, he said, you know, we have a lot to talk about, and it's going to have to happen over a long period of time. Oh, how beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, okay, I, I didn't know what to make of it all. I didn't know what it was. Mm. But it, except that it was compelling and it, it was essential. Mm. 
so, um, so how long did it take you to fall in love with him from that point? Mm. I think I already was in love with him. Okay. Yeah. I, I, that's the compelling... How long did it take you to realize that you were in love? Mm. You know, something would happen when I would go to his house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny. A friend of mine likes to say, love yourself and watch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was watching what I was doing, and I was fascinated by the choices I was making. I left the conservatory, mm -hmm. which was, you know, a dying breed of institutions mm -hmm. anyway, and that's a story, a whole other story I won't go to, but I just was watching the choices I was make, making to surround myself with him. I had just been in China right before then on a cultural mission from my conservatory, I was doing master classes in composition with students. Mm -hmm. I had with us Adia Gertavici, who was the head of our string department, who was looking for violin players, mm -hmm. string players, and the president of the conservatory and one other person. We had gone to China. I got lost in the Ming tombs, believe it or not. I lost the little group I was with, and I sat down rather bewildered, not knowing if anyone was ever going to find me. Mm -hmm. And by then, I had already come upon this learning practice, and I had already had the insights into learning that mattered most to me. And so while I was there, I said, I know what I'm going to do. Sitting on this bench in the Ming tombs, I had like this flash. I know what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I'm going to leave the conservatory, and I'm going to establish what I then called the New American School, a new wave in learning. What year was that? 1980. Mm -hmm. 1979, excuse me. 1979. And within... You're lost in... The Ming tombs in China. Th which, which tombs are you speaking of? Ming. Ming oh, dynasty. Ming tombs. Okay. Ming tombs. And at that time, there were no people in there. Now, I went back to China six or seven years ago. There were 10,000 people so you're in the lost Ming tombs. in the Ming tombs, and you have this vision of what you're going to do with the rest of Absolute your clarity. The New American School. The, I called it the New American School. Mm -hmm. And then I came back, and it was within two months that, you met that I met Bernstein. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, so since you referenced uh, this, um, I, I hate to do this because what we're talking about is so juicy, but, um, but let's at least, you, you, you pointed to this, you have this little card called Academy Learning Practice. I'm going to try to describe it. And it has, um, on the left-hand side, it has uh, an arrow pointing downward that goes from existing theory to application. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that that's how you see... Didactic the learning. The didactic learning. The dominant right. learning process. In and our actually, culture. why don't I let you, you, you talk us through this. So uh, how, how does that, that didactic learning relate to the circular learning that you describe on this mm -hmm. card? Well, I can give you a really good example and how I came upon this really. And, yeah. and it was while the, being the dean of the conservatory, mm -hmm. And, you know, a conservatory of music, in, in many respects, is a conserver of tradition and mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. And as a, a person who is a, just an avid improviser and who knows myself through the discovering of something I haven't yet heard, mm -hmm. I'm really interested in the not yet heard. Mm -hmm. Now, um, so that's my orientation, and that's what excites me, and that's what brings me to the edge of the seat. Mm -hmm. So... Um, as the dean of the conservatory, I was on all of the audition committees for new students coming into the college. Inner city Chicago, and so and it's a bachelor's, master's, and doctoral program at this college. Mm -hmm. So it's a full-service institution. Mm -hmm. So um, we would have these two groups of students that would come to come to the conservatory. Mm -hmm let's put them over here on my right side, would be these students who could play major and minor scales and arpeggios at 300 miles an hour. You know, they were just flawless, mm -hmm. well-schooled, uh, technically excellent, proficient, mm -hmm. and frankly, musically somewhat dead. Mm -hmm. There was not a vitality. There was nothing 
compelling to me mm -hmm. about these musicians, but they were flawless. Mm -hmm. And by the books, they would be the ones to bring into a conservatory. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, we would have these other students who would come who were garage band musicians mm -hmm. who had did not, and they were mostly inner city uh, uh, Spanish kids and black kids, African American kids, who had very little opportunity for any kind of practice and lessons or anything like that. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, economically uh, uh, challenged and didn't have these opportunities, but they were passionate music makers. Mm -hmm. So they would come in, and instead of doing what these kids would do, they would just do what they did in their garage bands. And they would do things like um, bum, ba da da dum, bum. Bum, ba -da 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 -da, and I would think, how did you get there? And so that began a dialogue about music with them, and um, through that dialogue, I could introduce them to language that they didn't yet have. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I could talk about ambiguity, and they might say something like, "Well, you know, I just really didn't want to do what everyone else does." Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, you, you actually took us into a whole other direction there. Are you aware? Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so that I would be able to talk about key aesthetic principles, which if you think about theory applied, you would read about aesthetic principles and then you would go and try to apply them. Mm -hmm. These kids were just stumbling upon them and they were doing it out of their own imaginations and risk taking because they didn't even know they were taking risks. They were just kind of breaking the mold. And I could give them a language for what they were already doing. Mm -hmm. And so I was connecting them from their own discovery mode and their own experiential process to didactic learning. In other words, theoretical frameworks, right. et cetera. And so what I learned through that was personally, and then this, this is where I veered a bit out of music into more general education. I learned that I believed that the kind of risk taking that these kids were taking would be probably really important to finding solutions to some of our more intractable problems. Mm -hmm. Because if they kept doing this, they were just in a way in these endless loops of repeating and repeating and getting better and better at repeating, mm -hmm. but they weren't leaping out of that into new territory. So the circular one, just walk us through the circle so we know. So in the circular one, you begin with an experience right. and you begin to um, move out of that experience to reflection. Right. And I like to think about it as um, if, I'm, if I'm on the piano and I'm uh, playing something, mm -hmm. there's a moment at which I often, as if I'm improvising, this is my approach to composition actually, mm -hmm. as I'm improvising, if I come across this moment of, wow, what was that I just played? Mm -hmm. What was that? What is this? What was that? What is this? That's reflection for me. And I begin to work with the material of that because I'm inspired by it. And then I continue to work with it and I begin to take it apart and I look for the pattern. And what is the root of the pattern? What is this? It's the question, what is this? Mm -hmm. Which was Bernstein's last phrase, by the way, as he died. What is this? Mm -hmm. And then I actually might tiptoe over to the other side and say, wait a minute, didn't, didn't uh, Shostakovich do that in his Eighth mm -hmm. Symphony? Wait a minute. Wait, what is this? Wait a minute. Wait mm -hmm. a minute. This is derivative. Mm -hmm. Is this right? You know, so there might be a moment of tiptoeing over to that to compare notes and actually ask myself the question, uh, is this just something that's planted in my mind from somewhere else and is that okay with me, mm -hmm. actually? Mm -hmm. Am I going to do something different with it? But again, I'm awake to history, but I'm actually continuing to stay connected to the feeling I had when that idea came out of me onto the piano. So I'm staying connected to the depth of um, feeling, mm -hmm. intuition. Mm -hmm. And so then um, as I go through this process and connect to history, I then move through, in this case, it would be the conceptualization in writing mm -hmm. or absolute perfecting an improvisation if I'm doing it through improvisation. 
-hmm. of what it is that I'm wanting to say. And that leads back to a new round of experience. It leads back to a new round of experience. Mm -hmm. And what's, what I think, if there's anything... Um, so you took say, that from music, and then you generalized that into learning, and then that became the foundational principle for the Academy for the Love of Learning. It is the foundational yeah, principle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really beautiful. So you and I have had a shared experience of, um, uh, of having an idea, uh, you, the Academy uh, uh, for, the love of, for the Love of Learning, and me, Commonweal, and finding a piece of land mm -hmm. um, and devoting more or less 40 years of our lives to this. Right. And really, this is what Jennifer was part of the heart of what Jennifer thought we would share in common, was just that we both had this experience. So what have you learned from speaking of the love of learning? What have you learned from having developed a passion 40 years ago when you were lost in the Ming uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, labyrinth in China? Uh, and had this idea, looked mm -hmm. for the land, finally found it, and then built mm -hmm. what I understand to be, I've looked at the, the website, this completely extraordinary campus, mm -hmm. which you continue to guide. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what has that mm -hmm. dharma, that trajectory mm -hmm. of 40 years mm -hmm. taught you? How are you... Mm -hmm. How have you been changed by it, and how, how do you hold that 40-year journey? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I can tell you one of the key questions that's living in me these days mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm a pretty peripatetic guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so um, I wander around mm -hmm. and I bring my teachings and learnings with me wherever I go. And I've really been interested in the impact of having a campus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think about, um, even though I knew it was the right thing to do as I was doing it, and I was speaking with my dear colleague Jessica, who's in, in the room here, uh, just on the way here today about... Um, the meaning of that building to people. Because it is the imbuing of the learning spirit in that building. People walk in there and something happens to them that is, it's a, it's a mystery. It, it, and I'm also aware of the time in history when we move from being wandering, peripatetic beings into institutionalized beings. Mm -hmm. And so um, my question is, what is the impact of institutionalization on learning? And, um, it's a profound question. Yeah. My, my uh, way of holding that is um, because people say to me, well, you know, after you're gone, what's the future of Commonwealth? Well, at an institutional level, I can say we have this remarkable executive director on Slosberg who's thinking about the next 40 years and you know we work as a team and right. you know I'm pl not planning to leave soon unless God so directs me but um, but my sense of lineage is not organizational mm -hmm. exactly my sense of lineage is that there is a never-ending supply of human beings who discover that their mission in life is to be of service in some way. Mm. That's a never-ending supply. And it's a very humble lineage. Yeah. Mm. It can be somebody taking care of a disabled child or whatever it is. But there are some of us who just innately find or make meaning in our lives by being useful. Yeah. And so um, mm. the way I hold Commonweal, mm. um, I hope it goes on for a long time, as long as it's doing good work. Mm -hmm. 
But it does become institutionalized and it does become bureaucratized. And the impact of the institutionalization and the bureaucratization on learning and on the whole field is profound. Yeah. Now, in order to exist as a piece of land, as a site, as a campus, that process of institutionalization, at least in our time, is necessary. I mean, nonprofits are a very highly regulated entity right now, so you have to have, you know, all kinds of stuff that surrounds it. Um, but um, the spirit of learning yeah. yearns to be free. Yeah. And, um, exactly. and that spirit of learning must exist in some tension yeah with the necessary institutionalizing process. At least that's, how do you hold it? Uh, well, I go back to this uh, yeah. learning chart. Mm -hmm. And so it's a dialectic. Right. There's a relationship between, so this in a way is, I feel like what happens at the academy is that there's a lot of learning and experience right. and accruing, and then I deposit it in the bank of theory. Mm -hmm. So I move it from here and I mm -hmm. plop it in over there. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a repository of it. Mm -hmm. What I'm frightened about is that it becomes an artifice, that it becomes a repository instead of lived experience. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it, it, there's a danger in that. But even, um, I think how I experience it in my lifetime is, um, how, does the academy, how does the academy keep up with me? Because I'm in the foreground of it. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I notice it brings me to silence, actually. So I think I'm living the the story right now, and I don't I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. I don't. I really don't know yet. I I you know in a kind of way I've let go of what happens with that campus. Mm -hmm. I feel as though it has a life of its own, mm -hmm. and so I don't feel attached to it. Mm -hmm. I do feel like I'd like to rest there someday. Mm -hmm. I'd like mm -hmm. to maybe be buried there or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also familiar to me. It's like I know every nook and cranny. Mm -hmm. We just completed a stupa on that campus, this stunningly beautiful, mm -hmm. um, which completes the campus for me. And I have felt it to be incomplete until now. And this stupa has been a 10 year project. And so now that feels complete. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like there's some ground there that is complete. That's the only mm. word I could use for it. You speak of a stupa, and you've talked about the impact of the Asian mm. uh, traditions on your work of, you know, yeah. uh, the Buddhist and uh, yeah. uh, Tibetan practices. And you've also spoken of your root in Jewish mysticism. And then there's the decision to frame the work of the academy in secular terms, yeah. even as you open right. to the spirit in all kinds of ways. And this lovely quote about um, uh, from Matthew Fox about uh, religion is to spirituality as uh, education is to learning. Right. Um, and um, you speak of taking this circular process of experience leading to reflection, leading to critical inquiry, leading to conceptualization, leading back into experience, and in the critical inquiry phase, mm -hmm. um, taking it back and depositing it in the, in the theory. Bank of theory. In the bank <laughs> of theory. Yeah. But the metaphor is interesting because what is deposited by its nature is not the lived, mm -mm. loving experience. That's right. Rather, it's the bank of right. money or cognition, cognition or scissors or that which can be cut up and dissected and That's quantified. Right. Right. And you spoke of yourself as peripatetic. And one of the interesting things about the peripatetic philosophers was that it was the lived experience of sharing philosophy that spoke to them. Right. If I remember correctly, I'm not sure, but weren't the peripatetic philosophers among those who distrusted writing 
because it was going to reduce philosophy mm -hmm. right. to something other than that which is lived and in the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hence, I haven't written a book. <laughs> I noticed you haven't yeah. written a book. Yeah, it's a really big um, concern of mine. Mm -hmm. I was telling Jessica just recently, even committing myself on tape mm -hmm. feels like a death experience. I understand that. <laughs> I live that death experience all the time. <laughs> really, I mean, she, they had me all lined up to go and talk about the history of the Academy, and mm. I, was I was feeling, oh, my God, I don't really want to do this. What's I going know. on inside of me? And so sorting all of that. And well, when you, what, one of the things that happens, mm -hmm. which is really to be wrestled with, yeah. when one has started something and been there for 40 years, <laughs> is that you become, in some sense, iconic, yeah. right? And that icon, mm -hmm. by its nature, mm -hmm. is very different from who you actually are. Absolutely. And in being considered iconic, yeah. you, you face a terrible choice between mm -hmm. whether to live in the confines of the iconic Icon. image yeah. or whether to be alive yeah. and break out of it all the time, yeah. you know? <laughs> I have a great Bernstein story yeah. for you, if yeah. I may. And, yeah. and I don't want to diminish the significance yeah. of this moment, yeah. but it just reminds me yeah. of uh, Tanglewood, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, uh, the Boston Symphony summer home is, and Bernstein was so connected to that, and yeah. Kusevitsky and Copeland, and, yeah. you know, the whole... So I used to drive up to Tango with him every year, and there was always the Bernstein concert, which happened around his birthday in August every year. Mm -hmm. and because, you know, he was a feature there, a fixture mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so one time, it's just an icon moment, <laughs> one time we get there, and he drove around, he drove around both in a little Volvo, I think it was, but he also drove around in this Mercedes, this vintage Mercedes convertible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we would drive up on the Taconic, this particular expressway that we would take to go up there. And I see some nodding heads, and some East Coasters here. And um, his license plate was Maestro One, right? <laughs> and so we would drive up in this car that would often break down, by the way. <laughs> and we'd get up there. And of course, invariably, people are honking and waving to him because it's Tanglewood and because it says Maestro One. Right. In case anyone should forget. <laughs> <laughs> and so then he starts lamenting and begroaning about, <laughs> I just can't seem to go anywhere without being recognized. It's so frustrating. <laughs> And I looked at him and said, have you thought of changing your license plate? I mean, it's, <laughs> shut up, you know. <laughs> and so I was just thinking about that tension of being an icon and in, in, in a certain kind of way, the attraction to that, mm -hmm. uh, which I don't have very much of. I'll be really honest with you. I'm really an introvert. Well, we share that in common. I mean, if you spend time around Commonweal, I have zero interest in being an icon, and I deflect it in every way. Nonetheless, it happens. It happens. Now, fortunately, Commonweal is so trivial that being an icon at Commonweal is like being a toy soldier at Walmart or something. <laughs> it's not, you know, an exalted position. But the point is that uh, I absolutely share with you being deeply introverted and completely, and yet... This thing happens, this crystallization mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of, you know, 40 years of whatever you've been doing, right. and people approach you with these projections, That's right. and the question is, what do you do with the projections? And what I do is deflect them, but yeah. still, it's, it's a phenomenon that right. happens with right. what we've been describing. Well, I find that I have to receive them. I can't deflect them. Okay. And I think um, if I deflect them, they become bigger, actually. Oh, really? So, I, I mean, not always, but I have found that. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, I receive them, and mm -hmm. it's an acknowledgement that I feel is justified, mm -hmm. and I feel is nurturing in a certain kind of way. Wow. Mm -hmm. However, I can't make them into anything bigger than a simple acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it helps, it helps me know I'm on track. 
frankly. It helps you. Know that I'm on track and that oh, the work oh, is having true. meaning and it's... Um, well, I'll have to think about that because I don't do that, you know. Mm-hmm. But it, maybe it's something I can learn. Jennifer, you've been listening to this and you brought us together. So as we come to the end of this conversation, what would you add or what would you, what comes to you that you would uh, be willing to share? Hmm. Well, I'll answer that in two ways. And the first way is just to make a comment on what you just talked about. Mm. projections becoming an icon Mm. deflecting or receiving Mm. both are valid ways Mm. but but I feel that in the receiving there is also an honoring of the other person who's projecting on you Mm. and therefore your own capacity to acknowledge then allows them to be received and relax and relax Mm -hmm. and then ultimately at its best then learn Mm -hmm. the essence of learning that Mm -hmm. that is possible and then they can take it back once it's received. Mm -hmm. Mm Because the projection was born within and you can't project what you haven't already conceived within yourself, right? right? Right. So it's a beautiful, what you've been talking about has been so Mm -hmm. moving to me this Mm -hmm. morning and it so speaks to the Mm -hmm. heart of taking a lid off learning Mm -hmm. but in a process that's been so deep that it's almost often beyond words to mm-hmm. articulate, but it's been a joy to be here in the midst mm-hmm. of hearing Thank you really you. speak mm-hmm. from the heart about these deep things. Mm-hmm. So what I would just add to that, Michael, is that I am so grateful to see you two together and to have you here, Aaron. Mm-hmm. It's been many years hoping for this connection and, and the kindred similarities between Commonweal and the Academy for the Love of Learning are so great Mm-hmm. Expressed slightly differently, but in essence, very much the same. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a joy to see you together, and I think the connection are kindred also personally, mm-hmm. of course. So yeah. I'm just grateful that you're both no, sitting thank there. You. And thank you, Jennifer. I'm a part of both your And Marty Krasny is sitting with us, who directs the Dalai Lama Fellows Program. And Marty, you are a man of uh, experience and wisdom. I wonder what your reflections are on the conversation. Well, I came, I came here with... a predisposition mm-hmm. that I thought would be part of your conversation and it hasn't been and mm-hmm. it's something that's been embedded for about the last six weeks which was that I had occasion uh, mm-hmm. to attend a luncheon meeting where Gordon Getty mm-hmm. the philanthropist and composer yes, was honored for having done the most for music in the Bay Area of anybody um, in the yeah. last year mm-hmm. and he spoke and then that evening I went to the David Brower Center mm-hmm. in Berkeley mm-hmm. where there was the opening mm-hmm. of an exhibition commemorating the work of Doug Tompkins, mm-hmm. the founder of Esprit, mm-hmm. who's bought more land in Latin America mm-hmm. to conserve it than any conservationist probably ever. Mm-hmm. And Gordon, in accepting his award, said exactly the same thing that someone quoted Tompkins as having said. Tompkins died two years ago in a boating accident. And the quotation from both of them, one man, a businessman, a conservationist, another one, an inherited wealth guy who was able to be a composer, was, if anything can save the world, it will be beauty. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, despite your background in music and despite all the things that I've experienced with you, Michael, I think you may have said beauty when you referenced the stupa, Mm. but I haven't heard the word beauty at all in this Mm. conversation, Mm. and yet I know it's a big part of both of your lives, the aesthetic of these places, Mm. and I've been to the academy, and I'd just i be interested in your observations about that quotation. Now, what a great line, and and let me reference that that Dostoevsky said uh, beauty beauty in, in beauty is the salvation of the world or beauty will sell, save the world so that line has a resonance that um, goes back nobody attributed they just took yeah it. yeah no no but I'm, well, I, yeah. it's yeah. Uh, and there's also a beautiful book on beauty uh, called beauty um, blocking on the name of the guy who wrote it it's an archetypal thinker. Do you I, I know the book. I have it sitting yeah, right on my yeah, desk. I yeah. can't think of his name. But th- thank you for that, Marty. So, yeah. absolutely. So, mm-hmm. will beauty save the world? <laughs> well, <laughs> I also, let's not forget the ode on the Grecian urn, mm-hmm. <laughs> beauty and truth. Um, 
Hmm. Something what I don't know how to put this exactly, but um, beauty is saving the world. Mm -hmm. Would be the way I would say it. And um, you know, it's it's a tricky word because beauty in one culture looks so different from beauty in, in another. Mm -hmm. So getting underneath the um, cultural frames of beauty to something that's deeper, proportion balance, aesthetics, when I think of beauty, uh, the beauty of balance in a human relationship, for example, um, is what I imagine you're pointing to by bringing that. Um, I think it is saving the world, if the world is going to be saved. I would also say... Um, at the academy, and I know you've been there, and uh, some others of you have been, there's something inculcated in that place that bespeaks beauty. And um, <laughs> I can give you a couple simple little examples. The offices. <laughs> the offices downstairs in the academy have double thick concrete walls. And it's because I didn't want, and I, I know where every screw, nut, and bolt in that place is. Because I had my hand in every screw, nut, and bolt in that place. Those walls are like that so that the electromagnetic fields on the other side of those walls don't come in and touch people. Mm -hmm. And the whole building is like that. Everything about that building was so thoughtful, so intentional. And I think that... Um, Trumpa wrote a book called Shambhala, The Path of the Sacred Warrior, mm -hmm. and he talks about mm -hmm. drala. We all know that word drala. And it is you create on the outside through the aesthetic, through beauty, the world of order that you want to have inside. Mm -hmm. And then it creates this beautiful echo and grows that beauty inside by having it outside. So I don't know how much of that is... Um, speaking uh, to what you're talking about. Do you have time for a couple of questions? Yeah, we can do a few. Sure. Uh, all right, since I asked. Yeah. Um, so, so many things, but I wanted to comment about this beautiful quote by yeah. John Bennett. Yeah. And what resonates very deeply with me, I wanted to get your yes. uh, sense of this as a professional musician. As you know, mm -hmm. I'm a professional musician. So I relate this very much to the idea of practice, yeah. and I think both meditation practice and music practice. When I think of conscious practice, of, yes. I'm a cellist, you're a pianist. Yes. When you um, become aware, you have a moment of awareness about some mm. something that you're doing yes. as a musician. Yes. Let's say, say somebody tells you, you, you rush at the end of the phrase, and you don't really mm. understand it, and then one moment you have the experience of becoming the person who is now aware I'm rushing at the end of the phrase. Once you have that experience, you become a different player. Right. And you can no longer do that because you That's have exactly that awareness. Right. And so I, I love the quote, you know, you, it's not that you're going to not act dishonestly, but you become a different person. You can't. Act you can't. That way. It's like, why would I right. rush? So it's that moment of awareness yeah. in practice that yes. makes you a different musician. And then, of course, repeating the new pattern right. uh, with yeah. the awareness, with the same consciousness, mm -hmm. which also was part of your circular, part of the circular. practice Thank learning. You, so I thought a lot about you know conscious mm -hmm. practicing, the awareness, the analysis. Mm -hmm the alteration of right. the way of doing it and then the repetition of the new aware, more aware way right. of becoming a different player. Yes. And that's how, if we're learning in this method, rather than the teacher saying, this is what you do and you copy it, which is the really didn't didactic but care. not uh, creative and not really embodied way that's of right. practicing. Right. So, I just, I completely agree. And, um, I often tell the story, I won't tell it now, but of Margaret Nichols, my piano teacher, who um, said to me, well, I guess I'm telling a little of the story. Are you aware that in the, uh, I, was, I remember the, uh, the uh, Beethoven sonata I was playing, uh, Opus 2, number one, to be specific, so it was an early t time in my life. That one. 
And she said, are you aware that you just modulated into the wrong key and that you've been playing in the wrong key for the last three or four minutes? And then I said, well, <laughs> sort of. But I did get back. She said, yes, you did. You got back to the right key. And I said, you know, I was young. And basically she just said to me, well, is that okay with you? And I said, no. Nah. And she said, do you, would you like to learn how to do it differently? And I said, Okay. <laughs> and so, because I was, you know, I said there are like 200,000 notes in this piece. And, you know, so I modulated it into the, but I did find, you know, it's like that. So she said, do you know how to fix that? And I said, well, not exactly. And she said, well, and you know this very well, and this is the practice part, but it's also the catching yourself in the mistake part. And she said, you actually have to slow it down so much that right before you hit a C sharp instead of an E flat, you actually tell your mind has to tell your finger to play the other note. And then you're going to hear it differently. And then you do that two or three or four times until you re, right? But the thing that was so interesting about it for me is that she said, you just want to express yourself. Mm -hmm. And so you're actually blinding yourself to the error in favor of the depth of expression. It's the Eros love conversation in yeah. a way, yeah. right? And so she said, you just want so much to express yourself. Mm -hmm. And she said, so now you'll hear it differently and you'll actually express really what the elegance or the beauty is that's in that sonata correctly. Mm -hmm. And it'll have a very different uh, meaning to you. Mm. So it, it completely changed my life. And I was 12 years old. Mm. It, you asked what I was doing around that age. That was what I was doing. Yeah. And that changed my life. And it actually became the foundation of my understanding of awareness and the meaning of awareness and how it works in a certain way. And I also wanted to make one quick comment about uh, yeah. the connotations for orchestra by yes, Aaron Copeland. Yes, by Aaron Copeland. Uh, talk about awareness. I... I was playing with the New York Philharmonic, Bernstein conducting uh, all Copeland concert. It right. was 1989, so a year before I was Copeland there. died. Right? Yeah. We talked about that. Yes. And as we were rehearsing the connotations yes. for orchestra, which is a very naughty, complicated... Gnarly. Nobody, the musicians hate to play it yeah. because it's, it's, it's not beautiful, accessible, easy to listen to Copeland. And so yeah. in the middle of this, you know, taking it apart at rehearsal and when he's putting it together, he stopped for a moment and he said... I just heard Appalachian Spring. Mm -hmm. Right in mm -hmm. yeah. it's like, So he had an awareness that something about Copeland's, you know, natural expression came through in the middle of this naughty, twelve-tone complex. Yeah, piece. So, beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Question. So, there's so much, so much enriching, rare wisdom here. And it's so huge and big picture and touches so deeply, just as you were talking about in the beginning, because mm -hmm. you live there. Yeah. So you can wake us up there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know that to write a book yeah. breaks that up into pieces. Yeah. And I forgot that piece. And how do I get that piece? And how mm -hmm. do I make it whole again? Mm -hmm. But would you please try? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think that I'm like one of the luckiest people on the planet that I got to be here today. Mm, thank you. But uh, we were, somebody said something about duty. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there must be some way for, I mean, what if, uh, you know, some of the great people in the world just said, I don't want to be the center of that. I get that. Mm -hmm. But... Channel. I'm really hearing you. Yeah. I'm truly am. What is your name? Nini. Nini. Yeah. Okay. I'm really. I will remember you. Your face and your <laughs> plea. And, <laughs> and I'm sure Jessica's here. <laughs> Sure, sure, the one that it sure. But maybe I can share one thing with you here at the end that um, I, f I felt 
was important, and I didn't say it before. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I'll, I'll be quick with this, because, I mean, it must be time for this to be fi complete. Um, when I told the story about Bernstein um, and about, I, he said to me, I don't know who you are, but I know that I love you. And that was in 1971 on my honeymoon. Um, the night before Bernstein died, um, I had dinner with him at the Dakota where he lived. And, um, and you kind of get a sense of what the prickliness was of our relationship and the profundity of it and the love. It was all about love, navigating love. And so um, he was in a wheelchair and he had only been in a wheelchair for the last month. He conducted a concert at Tanglewood in August, and he died in October, second week of October of 1990. And so I came into his bedroom at the Dakota. I helped him. He was waiting for me, and uh, he was in this little kind of like uh, paisley chair that he was sitting in. And he was a little guy. He was really small. People didn't, because he was on, he always wore these big, thick, uh, what do you call those, uh, uh, cowboy boots when he would conduct. <laughs> and so he had a big, thick heel. And so he always looked, and he was on a podium on top of it. So he always looked a little taller than he really was, but he was not. He was probably 5'7", maybe 5'8", yeah, something like that. So um, he saw me come in, and uh, he didn't see me come in. I came in and I knelt on the floor in front of his chair and I put my hands on his knees and he opened his eyes and he looked at me and he became very all aglow mm -hmm. and um, we talked and he said, what did you do today? And I said, what did you do today? What does it look like I did today? You know, it was like that. So um, at a certain point, the little buzzer, it's the old-fashioned phones with the lights that went on, remember? Mm -hmm. uh, the light went on and it was Julia, the housekeeper, who had been in the Bernstein family for 30 plus years. She was from Chile. And she said, Mr. Estern, dinner is ready. And okay, Julia, she made us matzo ball soup and you know, all of our favorite things. And I helped Lenny into his wheelchair. And I took him out of the room, his bedroom, and wheeled him down this long hallway to what was called the morning room, which is where Often breakfast were, but this time dinner was going to happen. And then we get to the morning room. I pull him into, up to the table, reconnect his oxygen machine. Julia walks in, and she brings some food in and puts it down on the table. And we're looking across at each other, like you and I are right now. Nini, did you say? And yeah. I and I. And I. So we look across at each other. And he, then he just, I, I suddenly had this sinking feeling like, or weird feeling something was going to happen and I didn't know what. And I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And then he just looks at me and he says, is there anything else I can do to help prepare you for my death? Can you imagine the generosity of that? I'm talking about love. That's beautiful. Mm. So I looked at him and I just said, well, first of all, I panicked because it never occurred to me he was dying. We had an academy to create. We had work to do. And while it looked like he was ill, I figured he was going through a passage mm. and that actually what was happening was he was going to finally give up what he used to call running around the world, waving his hands in the air. He said, I just don't want to keep doing this. So I felt like he was finding his way out of doing that into something that he and I shared deeply, which was education. I was wrong. Mm. But at the time when he said that to me, I panicked inside. I just thought, dying? What? Who's got time for that? I mean, it was like that. And um, I, I, all these thoughts went through my mind. It was just stunning, all of the complexity of thoughts that went through. Make sure that I have the keys to your studio. You know, <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't even know where to begin. And so as I looked at him, 
and he had these sort of grayish, bluish eyes, the most beautiful color. And I, I, I just kept looking at him, and he steadied me. And so ironically, it was his steadying me at that time. And so my mind calmed. By then, I was a big-time meditator. It didn't, help me a lo- it didn't help me at all. My mind calmed, and then it was just the two of us sitting across from each other, and then I knew what to say. And so this was the bookend of 20 years of knowing each other. And so I said, I guess I just need to know that you know I love you. And he just looked at me and he said, I do. I feel it. And so in that moment, something completely relaxed in me and in him. And... um, So it began 20 years earlier with, I don't know who you are, but I know I love you. And it ended with, I know you love me. Thank you. you. Beautiful. There's a part of me that is neoplatonic and that uh, truth and beauty... um, I know that the complexities of culture, but I I want to believe that there are uh, resonances of truth and beauty that transcend culture. I feel that. Yeah. yeah. We as just have as to for be... goodness, goodness is more complicated because mm. moral structures are so different. Um, but I want to believe that you know, that the golden rule or something like that um, as a guide to goodness um, mm-hmm. is, is valid. Um, mm-hmm. Michael, I'd like to just add something uh, yeah. that comes out of a musical paradigm that yeah. comes to my mind uh, because it, it relates to goodness um, and behavior, actually. Yeah. Um, I think that one of the key moments in my life was in Carnegie Hall listening to a performance of Mahler's Second Symphony, Hmm. his Resurrection Symphony. And, you know, it's this profound vision of sister and brotherhood, uh, human beings coming together and being able to be together in harmony in such beauty. And the very definition of beauty for me um, and um, at the end of this performance, and it was in the 80s, early 80s, I would say, um, people all stood up, and we were all inside the numinous experience of that symphony and the ending of that symphony and the resurrection that happens in that symphony. And we were all partaking in the beauty and the joy and the grace that was present. Bernstein conducting. And um, when it was over, the lights began to come up after all of the curtain calls, and the clapping stopped. People turned toward each other, and the pushing and the shoving began. Mm -hmm. To get to the taxi line on a rainy night in New York. And the discrepancy between the beauty that we experienced at the end of that symphony and the human behavior that followed it became the impetus for my devotion to the creation of the academy. It came out of that and wanting to bridge that gap. And, you know, will we ever behave beautifully? More and more so. I thought you were going to say that people turned to each other and hugged. You would have thought. <laughs> you would have hoped. But that, that gap is um, painful and produces enormous suffering. And um, it's impossible. But yet, that's the work, isn't it? Is to der- take that inspiration and that um, human, I mean, we did that. That symphony happened. It was there. It was real. It was right there. 
But if we don't enact the beauty, um, we're not um, moving, we're not evolving, we're not growing into our potential. Aaron Stern, president and founder of the Academy for the Love of Learning, musician, teacher. Um, I am so touched by our conversation. I feel I have so much to uh, learn from you. Mm -hmm. And um, I am just very grateful for this encounter. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Same, 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 yeah. same. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.